Welcome everybody, I'm Daryl Ehrlich, I'm the editor of the Billings Gazette, and I am happy to be today talking with Frank Dahl. Frank lives in Billings, and he was in the U.S. Army from 1949 to 1953. This is part of our Stories of Honor program, and, uh, and we're here talking on a beautiful uh, spring day in 2019. Frank, thanks so much for being here, I really appreciate it. Now, I'm going to start off, I usually don't do a lot of talking on this, but I need to tell one story. One of the things, we talked several years ago when I was doing the Vietnam Voices Project, and you reminded me that Korea was the Forgotten War and that I was doing a pretty good job of forgetting. <laughs> so, uh, I want to, I want to, I, I don't know that I can make up for all of that, but I want to talk to you about your time in the Army and your time in Korea. Um, but I like starting at the beginning. So. Give me a little bit of background. Where did you grow up, and uh, and and how did you get into the army? Tell me about that. I uh, grew up in Valley City, North Dakota, over in the east, about sixty miles west of Fargo, and uh, my dad and my brothers and uh, many of my cousins are all in the service, so we just kind of. Uh, you're going to go to the service, or, you know, that yeah. follow the gang. Yeah. So there was no question for you that you were going to serve in the service, right? No. Okay. So you, you, you enlist in 1949. Did you, uh, and you had missed, ostensibly you'd missed World War II. Did you, did you know what you were getting into? Well, the, when you're at that age, you're pretty naive, you know. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was some money, you know. Right. And we, I was in college yeah, at the time, so I thought, well, a little extra buck here or two would help. <laughs> right, right. Now, uh, most of the, well, I'm guessing, did, did you have older brothers who had fought in World War II, or what was two. your? Two. Okay, and two? My oldest brother, Ken, was a Navy corpsman with the Marines. He was decorated on Okinawa okay. uh, for valor. Uh, and although he was in the Navy, he was assigned to the Marine Corps as a corpsman. And my uh, other brother was in the Navy also during World War II. Okay. Were you concerned, uh, you know, this was, uh, World War II was done. Were you concerned about seeing combat or were you worried about war? Not a lick. Okay. So you thought, I mean... I don't want to, this is a terrible metaphor, but you had dodged the bullet. I mean, you had, uh, uh, you had probably thought, I'm guessing in 1949, you're think you're not really thinking about more war. It was, I know. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, what, we, what we were trained. Where did you do basic and uh, where were you trained and what were you trained to do in the Army? Well, I, uh, I was uh, assigned to a mortar uh, heavy weapons squad. Okay. Uh, of an uh, infantry outfit, and uh, then in 19, um, winter of 1950, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, although there was six or seven of us decided we were going to go in the Navy because of the Korean thing had started. Mm -hmm. So six or seven of us went to Fargo and decided we were going to join the Navy and sleep in at least decent places. <laughs> uh, and uh, my oldest brother, the one I told you was decorated on Okinawa, was going to school at North Dakota State at the time. Mm -hmm. And he called that, the recruiting office, and he said, uh, have you signed anything yet? And I said, no. And he said, well, I want to talk to you before you do. So went over and visited with him, and he said, they called out the uh, North Dakota National Guard first in uh, World War One, and then two, they won't call them this time. So I would stick with the Guard. He said, you don't want to be in the Navy for six years. So uh, listening to my oldest brother Sage advice, I decided to nix the Navy. And, and about two weeks later, guess what? You're going to Camp Rucker, Alabama for infantry training. Wow. And that was it. Yeah. So uh, did you, uh, what did you know about Korea in 1950? 
not much. Yeah. Heard of it and that was it. Right. Did at the time <laughs> Excuse we, me. we can look back and see that we we fought a war there, but did did people in nineteen fifty really think that we were going back into combat? I don't think so. Okay. Were you worried going to when you got that call up notice to Camp Rucker, what did what do you remember thinking? We thought, well, heck, we'll go down here and have some more training and to be here uh, six months and go back to North Dakota. Right. And uh, it didn't work out that way. How did it work out? Tell me how it worked out for you. Well, uh, the um, companies there were uh, not sent, you know, uh, all at one time. It was piecemeal man here, two men here, three men there. And they started in, uh, I think, the first part of July. Okay. Taking filler replacement, as they called it, to send to FECOM, Far Eastern Command, which was uh, Japan or Korea. And each company, of course, was given a quota, et cetera. And your name comes up and you go. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Uh, and so in uh, the latter part of July, uh, my name came up and a friend of mine, and next thing you know, we're on a ship heading for Korea, and we knew where we were going. And by that time, there was no doubt that we weren't going to be stationed in Japan or <laughs> anything like that. We were going to some place in Korea. Yeah. Do you remember your name coming up? I mean, how did you? How did you get called? How did you know that it's you, not just? general but it's you who are going we'd been out on bivouac for a week and when we came in uh you always have reveille at uh, uh, the evening and start reading the names and f.e doll here you go <laughs> f.e doll so <laughs> f.e doll goes and uh is it like the next how, how quickly from that time that you get called do you pack about, up and go about two weeks okay what were those two weeks like? Is that a nerve-wracking time? I mean, knowing where you're going, or no. was it? Like I say, you're pretty naive when you're 19, 20 years old, and yeah. Um, so, uh, I uh, I didn't have any druthers about it. I, I okay. Just, yeah, and uh, a good friend of mine, uh, who has since passed on, uh, he was going to so. Uh, and, the two of us got on a train in Birmingham, Alabama, and next thing you know, we're in Seattle. And it's a long train ride. Well, we stopped off. Uh, we had a little time in Valley City. Okay. Uh, and then uh, back on the train, Seattle, Fort Lawton, on a ship to Japan one night in Japan, and the next day you're on your way. Okay. How long did that journey across uh, the Pacific take? About 16 days. Okay. What do you do on a ship for 16 days if you're heading to Korea? <laughs> uh, try to stay out of the way. Right. You know, it just, yeah. It was uh, approximately 3,400 guys on that wow. ship. Wow. At, at, did it ever, uh, you said that you were kind of naive at 19, and I remember, man, mm -hmm. I was too. Uh, did it ever hit you that where you were going, or you were you just along for the ride? Yeah, just along for the ride. Okay, so you you overnight in Japan, and then you get to Korea. What what's your first impression, or what's your first memory of Korea? Uh, we got off a uh, main ship, and they because the tide was out, we had to load on to like some kind of a landing ship, okay. and that took us into the. Uh, harbor at Incheon. Okay. And uh, off the ship there, uh, they marched us to Incheon. Incheon was, it almost looked like the pictures of Hiroshima at that time because they'd been back and forth through there, I don't know, like three times already. Uh, Chinese come down back and forth. Uh, so right. it was devastated. It was just. Right. And you see it now, you know, it's just unbelievable the, right did you uh at that point i man i imagine walking through an actual place that had been hit by war was different than what you had saw in the united states right did that did that i, I 
even at being naive, did that spook you or anything? Still or did didn't sink in. Still didn't sink in? Okay, yeah. so what did you do after, after they marched you through Inchon? What did they do? They put us on uh, some kind of a train. Okay. It was uh, the ugliest uh, <laughs> <laughs> coach. Uh, these seats were just uh, like a 90-degree uh, angle. There was no slope to them. And uh, jammed in there like sardines. And uh, I thought, hey, the heck with this. I crawled underneath the seats and went to sleep. It was much more comfortable underneath uh, than it was sitting in the seats. Huh. And uh, they took us up somewhere north, uh, up around the MGM River, and that's where they, uh, we got out. Okay. And then once you got out, what happened? Well, I was supposed to go to the 24th Division, and... Uh, got there and uh, the rear headquarters and they said no you're going to 25th so they had a had a truck there and hauled us over there a few of us guys and uh wound up uh but the iron triangle campaign there uh, thing was going on then it was a big push to uh, see if they couldn't get the chinese welded up Anyhow, uh, it, it's over in the Kumwa area, okay. kind of in the middle of Korea. And so we, uh, that's where I joined the 35th Infantry Regiment. Okay. And uh, 35th or 25th? 35th. 35th? 35th Infantry, uh, oh, our Re Regimental division. Combat Team, is part of the 25th Division. Okay. Got it. So you're there. Uh, what, you, you get to there, you get assigned, and when you get there, what does it look like? What do you notice? Uh, like I say, you're kind of oblivious to things, okay. and it was uh, it was uh, late in the evening, so it was pretty getting pretty dark, mm -hmm. and uh, just went up uh, the uh, hill, and uh, there was a little fireworks going on, but nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lieutenant, my platoon leader, said, "You're going to this." Hole with this guy, and that was it. Hmm. So what's like? So what was life like in, uh, in Korea, at least at the beginning? And tell me, tell me what it's like being a, a soldier in Korea in 1950, 51. <laughs> uh, I have a cousin. I had a cousin. He passed away a number of years ago, and uh, he was on Guadalcanal with the 164th, and uh, he. Uh, I have a clipping of it with us here that uh, he, he killed over 100 Japanese one night himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, the night before I was to ship out from or get out of Valley City, the, he and I went out and had a few libations to mm -hmm. soothe things. And uh, he said, uh, keep your mouth shut, your head down. He said, you'll get along. Right. And, uh, so you, you learn quickly. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't take many days of uh, little strife to smarten you up. Yeah, yeah. What do no you matter mean? how naive you are. Right. So was that good advice to keep your mouth very, shut and head down? Very, very good advice. Yeah. You're a tall guy. It seems like you'd be an easy target if you didn't <laughs> keep, keep your head down, right? Well, uh, you learn like I say, to keep your nose down and, and, and your nose clean, I mean, and your head down, so. Yeah, so uh, when you wake up and it's morning, what's, what's daily life as a soldier like in Korea? What do you do? Well, at that time, you know, the peace talks had already started. Okay. And, uh, but there was anything but peaceful. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, well, because the, the, the Chinese were probing all the time, and so were we, and uh, patrols, listening mm -hmm. posts, etc., going on, and even though the peace talks are going on up at Pan Jum, mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't much peace along the 38th. Right, right. What was the what was the terrain like? Very uh, uh, mountainous, not like the Rocky Mountains, but uh, uh, in the Kumwa area, there isn't much area there that like. Um, Armor uh, tanks and that—it's too hilly or right. mountainous. 
So you had, uh, what, what did you have, uh, what was the camp like where you were stationed? Uh, so is, is it, is it very large? Do you well, no, have... you're not stationed in any okay. camp. Okay, you're, you're, you're out in the field. You're, you're out along the line, uh, okay. MLR, we called it, main line of resistance, in uh, bunkers or foxholes, uh, all along the line from east to west coast of Korea. Wow. Uh, so someone once described uh, 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 kind of combat, and especially a lot as as moments or long stretches of intense boredom punctuated by moments of terror. Is well, that, is that is that about? I, I think that's a pretty good description. Mm -hmm. uh, like I say, you you learn fast. I, I know that uh, I was going over to this uh, uh, bunker, such as it was, uh, and I, I was like I say. Oblivious of things, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, again, let me state this: I am not a hero. Uh, my wife might think I'm some kind of a hero, but I, I'm not a, a big hero from Korea or anything like that. But anyhow, uh, first thing I, uh, I introduced myself to this man, uh, and. Uh, I said uh, back my where I come from, uh, they I had the nickname Punk. That, that my dad hung on me when I was like two or something. Anyhow, I said I'm Punk Doll, and he said if you don't get your head down, you're gonna get punked. And I, I didn't realize there was anything going on. And he said, don't you hear that? And it was like a tick, tick, tick of a fingernail, like. Mm -hmm. And that's something going by that you don't want to have a part of. Hmm. And those were bullets. Those were bullets. About how far away were, and I'm guessing you're fighting Chinese soldiers up there? And you, North and Koreans. North Koreans. So you're fighting, uh, did you, when you looked out, did you see them or did you see anything? At or? times you'd see them, okay. sometimes too many. Right. <laughs> were, you, were you, I mean... If there are too many and you're out in a mountain in Korea, are you are you afraid? Of course you're afraid. It's, uh, but at the moment, you know, you uh, you don't have time to be wondering, am I going to get shot or something? You know. Yeah. Um, and like you mentioned, that there's periods of uh, just not doing anything, uh, keeping your. Uh, rifle clean, etc. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, any patrol or uh, listening post, things that, that, uh, that puts a little adrenaline going. Yeah, tell me about <laughs> a, Tell me about going out to a listening post. Uh, tell me what that was like. Well, it's always at night mm -hmm. and you and one other guy go out in front of the main line, uh, two, three hundred, 500 yards, depending upon where they want, and you sit there. Mm -hmm. And it's not very <laughs> self-assuring to be out there but yourself, uh, sitting in this hole or just, just sitting out, and actually no hole, you're just sitting out there looking to see if there's any enemy activity at night. And, uh, and the uh, winters are not, they're quite cruel there, you know, something like, uh, northern Montana, 24 below is the coldest I saw it there. Wow. And uh, sitting out in a snowbank at a listening post, it, it's kind of uncomfortable. Right. People think uh, sometimes when I think we think of Korea or the Pacific as tropical, you know, but it, it's not. It's it, 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 What was the weather like there? Well, it's, it's very much like uh, here in Montana. Okay. Yeah. Did that surprise you when you or did you know that? No, I... Yeah, like I said, I knew about what the right. the uh, uh, longitude and latitude of it was, but uh, like I say, a kid, you don't. Yeah, did you, uh, uh, how do you keep warm in 24 below when you're just out in a bunker? When I first went there, we had the old shoe packs, which is a rubber sole with leather up above and uh, a felt insole, and they're terrible. Yeah. And a lot of us, uh, 
through them and uh, just wore our, our combat boots because at least you could deal with it. But then later on in the winter, we got the uh, what we called Mickey Mouse boots. <laughs> they're big, but they're very good for keeping your your feet warm. But they're they're hell to try to run in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're really heavy, right? They're hell, cold. yeah. They're yeah. you've probably seen those things. Right. Uh, construction workers, a lot of them wear. Right. Them. Right. Tell me, uh, what, what in the summer, hot too? Yes. So it was it was very much. Uh, was the battle against the weather or elements if you're out? Was how, how much was that? Was well, that the, the, the uh, summers were, you know, like I say, much like here, mm -hmm. and uh, the winters, uh, uh, because there's quite a bit of snow on that. There's not a lot of activity mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the very nature of the beast uh, does not allow, uh, you know, a lot of activity. Uh, by us or them, uh, and when I say them, the enemy, because uh, you show up like a sore thumb, you know, in that snow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so so bunker uh, was most of the life there just holding a line in in, in bunkers yeah. and yeah. trenches. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds uh, was it? Uh, it sounds kind of at times boring and miserable and at other times terrifying because you can't run back, there's not fences, right? You you have no. to fight where you're at. Right. Yeah. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about the enemy, uh, North Korean Chinese. What kind of soldiers were they and what kind of, and, and how, how did you regard them when you were out on the line? Well, I know they're tenacious as hell. Uh, they're, they're digging every night. As soon as it gets dark, they're, they're digging. and. You can hear the shovels and the pickaxes going. And they're digging in somewhere, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, uh, there's, there's a lot of rocky soil there, so it's it's tough digging. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but they're they're tenacious, and uh, they wore like a tennis shoe, high top tennis shoe, uh, made out of cloth. And that's what they had on their feet. And uh, but like I say, they're tough buggers. Yeah, yeah. And what kind of a what was your standard uh, uh, issue for weapon? And, and what did you what did you guys? I use? carried an M1. M1. What did you? What was your opinion of an M1? Was that what, did you oh, like that? It's a great rifle. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, when you were in the. What, what's uh, what is. Uh, Food and what what kind of communication did you have when you're out there? Uh, the uh, uh, platoon headquarters uh, they have uh, W W E eight radios and so on. So there's also contact with the rear, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, sometimes had uh, like uh, phones connected to some of the bunkers, you know, okay. like a uh, squad leader or something. Mm -hmm. How many people were in a bunker? How many? Uh, Usually two. Two. And did you rotate or were you there for the duration with your with the partner or how did oh, that work? Oh, no, he was with his partner until he rotated or uh, whatever. And where would you rotate? Back, you to, back, back, to, the, back to the states. Okay. Uh, how long was your tour? How long were most people staying out there? Uh, nine, ten months. Okay. Was the, uh, so, and what was the food like? Was it just the, the ration packs or what? Mostly, yes. Was there any good food or was it all well, free Well, they, they tried. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like a ringing endorsement. They tried. Yeah, yeah that's a, uh, Bob Euchre say, he, I, uh, I went on my tombstone, I tried. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Getting the food up the hill mm -hmm. or mountain or whatever you want to call it was very, very tough, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so consequently in the wintertime, they would uh, say, well, you're going to get a hot meal today. And by the time it got there, many times it was more like a, a frozen, frozen dinner. Uh, yeah, the, the um, uh, scrambled eggs and the, the pancakes or whatever. But like I say, they, they did their best, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Was there, um, at that time, was there air support or anything for the lines? Were they doing yes. that too? Tell me how that would work. We had excellent air, uh, air uh, support from the Marines and uh, some uh, from the uh, uh, Army, but we saw mostly Marine uh, Corsairs mm -hmm. and they put a good air show on for us quite frequently. Okay. <laughs> what do you remember about those? Uh, oh, like well, of course, when they come, the enemy stays down and we come out like a bunch of uh, rats or something to right. watch the show, you know, and, right. <laughs> and, to, and to let them know where you're at. Yeah, right? and it, it, usually it was uh, they were strafing or napalming the enemy, and uh -huh. of course we're cheering them on. <laughs> cheering them on. Yeah. Did they? Did was there any counterattack from? Did they have any air support or were they? I never saw okay. uh, uh, Chinese or Vietnam or North Korean airplane while I was there. Mm -hmm. When you're over there, do you, uh, I mean, we know that there's a communist threat and all of that, and that's at the height of, of communism, uh, kind of the threat to democracy. What was the, what was your understanding of why you were over there as a 19, 20 year old soldier? To put a uh, halt to communism. Okay. Was that a, uh, 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 when you're in a, is it something that you were talked about or is it something that was just understood? Just understood, I think. Okay. Who did you spend, uh, do, do you remember who was in the bunker with you? Do you remember those guys or do they? Lots of them. Okay. What was, uh, uh, so you're in a bunker. About how big would you say a bunker is for those? Well, there, it depends upon, uh, because like I say, that war went back and forth, you know, mm -hmm. like a yo-yo, up and down and back and forth. And yeah. so the, and the, um, the French had been there the Japanese had been there, uh, so there were bunkers here and there all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, but usually it was a place big enough for you, where you could have a sleeping bag laid out and a little room alongside of that. Okay, and and you did you uh, when you were in there? What was from day in day out, is it just watching, or what? What's what's a daily? What's daily? Well, give me an idea of what a daily routine is. Well, the uh, daily routine is uh, when you're uh, uh, under ranking uh, man, uh, they come around and check on you every day to see how you're doing, how's your ammunition, etc. And then you spend your time, like I say, cleaning weapons and making sure things are in working order, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then uh, I wound up being a platoon sergeant, which uh, then yeah, it was my job to check on my men daily. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you were supposed to know their shoe size and everything else. I'm not sure that I ever knew that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. uh, it's a uh, it's the same routine every day. Uh, yeah. Was it more stress? I mean, is it more stress being a platoon sergeant? I mean, you're kind of responsible for the, these men, right? You feel uh, very responsible for your men because mm -hmm. they're they're going to watch your back and vice versa, and there's a lot more of them watching your back than the, the other way around. So yeah, yeah, it's very very um, tough on you when you see somebody yeah. cash in. Yeah, what the. Uh, what did you miss most about home? Food. <laughs> <laughs> Any particular food? Did you, did you uh, think about anything when you were over? Like, when I get home, I'm going to eat this. Well, uh, milk, you know, that right. was uh, one of the big things. Uh -huh. And, uh, of course, uh, my mom was a good cook. And, yeah. Uh, uh, so we missed her cooking. Yeah. Did you get any kind of correspondence or letters from home, or do you have any yeah. kind of communication? Oh, what, yes. do you, what do you remember about that? Did you write? Could you write letters? Could you? Uh, I think the first letter I got, uh, uh, or letters I received from home, were uh, probably five or six weeks after I got there because okay. it takes a little time, mm -hmm. and uh, they were kind of ear ragged, uh, you know, from mm -hmm. uh, being here and there, but. And then the men on the mail came through pretty, pretty, pretty good. Pretty. Like I would say maybe two weeks mm -hmm. from a letter mm -hmm. from home. Yeah. 
uh, and I bet you said you missed the cooking. Yeah. Um, was it helpful? Girl, listen, I, I uh, spent time out in Fargo and Moorhead, so I know what those winters are like. Was it helpful growing up in a place like uh, Valley City to yes. endure the weather? Yes. I have a good friend, uh, one of the few that are left of us. There's, uh, it's, I don't want to sound morbid, but it, there's uh, about 500 of us Korean War vets go on every day. Yeah. Which he's, is, well, anyhow, yeah, and he's from California. Uh huh. And uh, he's a uh, Hispanic, but a great kid. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a kid anymore, but. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he and I still go to the 35th reunions, uh, Robert Pez is his name, uh, he, he lives in Lancaster, and he just hates the cold. Right. And he lived up at Big Bear Lake for a while, and it was his daughter that lived up there, and he, he finally moved out of there, he said, I couldn't stand the cold. Well, of course, it's not nearly as cold there as it is in Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> right, yeah, no, that's true. There are very <laughs> few places that can be. So, uh, when you were uh, uh, over there, were there, uh, is the, was the firefight or the combat, was it when you were engaged in that, how long did that last, and what did you, what do you remember seeing? Sometimes. 15 minutes, mm -hmm. sometimes a couple of days. Yeah. On those couple of days, on the longer ones, did it, was it hard to keep your energy up or what do you remember about those? You, you just, you just go. It, yeah. It's, I, I know that uh, like 717 um, and Sniper's Ridge, uh, I brought an article along that if, uh, guy that I knew from L Company, the sister company, uh, had written, and uh, Colonel Jones, and I, he was a great uh, uh, battalion commander, I, I really liked the man, big guy, uh, and uh, he came up and uh, in our area, and he was looking every day, and observed no movement, I observed no movement. And uh, I don't know whether, I, I'm sure he got orders to do something, but anyhow, we, they uh, pushed off that morning and uh, L Company went out and got the hell kicked out of him and we pushed through them and I jumped in this hole and uh, I said to this kid, and we were both kids, <laughs> uh, I said, well, it's getting a little hot around here. He said, yeah. And I said, uh, I knew he wasn't from New Jersey, <laughs> and he wasn't from the South. And I said, where are you from? And he said, you never heard of the place. And I said, try me. And he said, I'm from Williston, North Dakota. Huh. And I said, well, I'm not too far from you. I said, I'm from Valley City. And he is still alive. He still lives in Williston. He's not doing very well, but he's still alive. And... Uh, the article I, I brought along with me, uh, his brother, there were two brothers in that L company. Uh, I think they hauled like 70 some guys off the hill that day. Huh. You know, uh, and it just went on and on. And uh, con <laughs> contrary to what Colonel Jones said about, uh, I observe no movement. I talked to some guys from K Company later on, and they said, when you guys pushed off, and Sniper Ridge isn't very big. It's probably like from here down at the Northern Hotel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but on the other side of the ridge, uh, this guy said it was just like ants crawling over there, the Chinese, you know. Huh. Wow. And, uh, uh, the operation didn't go quite the way it was planned. <laughs> Let right. me put it that yeah. way. <laughs> Did you? Was it? I re, I know that in my work with Vietnam, they felt like it was always taking things, and then you'd get pushed back, and they they didn't feel like there was ever a lot of ground gain. Is that the same? Well, as that's, it's kind of that way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like uh, I was never on that place, uh, but uh, you read uh, this is in fifty three when the war was theoretically, the theoretically over. You know, pork chop. 
back and forth, back and forth. And guys getting killed every other day, taking that lousy piece of your real estate and then giving it up and so on. Yeah. And it, it was, uh, you know, just a, like I say, a stalemate of, of uh, punching and counter punching. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever, like, when you heard stories that the Chinese were as thick as ants right over Sniper's Hill, Sniper's Ridge, uh, did you ever worry about being overrun? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that has to play with you a bit, well, right? Your yeah, mind. but at that stage of the game, uh, we had, uh, we didn't have this, uh, like, up at the Yellow River. Those guys had hell up there, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, Chosen Reservoir, where they, uh, the old saying was, we were attacked by the Chinese and we killed two hordes, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, we never saw this, you know, mass of, of hundreds of, or thousands of guys charging up and down the hill. Seven one seven came pretty close. Yeah. Did you? Uh, so once you, you know, when you you described that clicking when you first got there, did you pick? Uh, I imagine you tune yourself into those things pretty yes, pretty uh, very quickly. quickly. Yeah. And another uh, thing that. Uh, the first day or two I was there uh, on Mortar Knob, we called it. It was a just a bald knob of a hill. It looked like one of these adobe hills out in the, con out in the country here. And uh, there wasn't a stick or a tree or a shrub or nothing because of all the, the mortar rounds going in there. And you hear this, whoop, and that's when they put the mortar around in the tube and you hear that and that's a good sound but when you hear it's too late yeah uh, so you you keep your ears tuned for this these sounds it, mm -hmm. it helps yeah i bet there's sounds you've never forgotten right i mean you can still hear them today oh little i i, I could hear them but not. right what's the um uh, did you have to go out on, was there such a thing, at, were you in the bunker, did you have to go out on a pr patrols or anything yes. like that? Yes. What, tell me about what a patrol was like in Korea. They, there was several types of control, uh, patrol, one was uh, for recon only, mm -hmm. and then uh, sometimes they, we called them firefight. That meant that you were to go until you run into the enemy. Okay. That would have been... No, so, always at night. Yeah. Uh, go until you run into the enemy would have been a little uh, a little nerve-wracking, I imagine, because you're kind of going out looking for the fight, right? Yes. <laughs> what did you... Uh, yeah, that's white knuckles. What did you... Uh, when you went out looking, how many men were going out, and how did you see around there at night? Usually it was uh, a reinforced squad that would be probably 12... Okay. 15, 16 guys. Doing things like walk and point and... Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Spread uh, out so one round don't get you off. Yeah. And uh, did, were those... Uh, uh, were they successful? Because I know that sometimes when you go out on patrol, you look for them and you never really find them. Or right. were they... Did that... Yes. Uh, yeah. That, that happened lots. Okay. And when I was with the uh, weapons platoon, then we didn't have to go, but then when I become platoon leader of third platoon, which is a rifle platoon, then we had, uh, that was part of our job. Yeah. Did you, uh, uh, when you were over there, it's one thing to be 19 and naive, but then you, you get the, you get over there and, um, uh, was it hard for some of the guys, especially when you're a platoon sergeant to adapt to life in, in that, or did they? Most of them were really good. Okay. Yeah, we had a, a few, you know, that um, were a little troublesome, but for the most part, they're great guys. And uh, mm -hmm. um, like I say, they have your back and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So you were were you over there for nine months, or how long were you little, over there for? I was there uh, from the time I left the States to the time I got back was about 13 months. 13 months, that's, that's a long time to be over there. Well... It, uh, I, 
I was one of the lucky ones, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you ever, did you ever, when you were over there, did you ever wonder if you'd make it back to the States? You wonder that, but uh, like I said, you, you can't play on that. It, it drives you crazy. Yeah, yeah. So your, your, uh, your recipe for success, keep your mouth shut and your head down. That will help. <laughs> what uh, else helps? Well, uh, and uh, the other thing is, the the longer you're there, the more cautious you get. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know that uh, one of the, uh, well, it was uh, kind of got to me. I uh, found out that uh, the uh, company commander come down and he said, tomorrow night you're going out and we're going to see if we can't capture some enemy for intelligence work and you're going to be this and I, I thought God, tonight I'm close to going home I knew I was going to get going pretty soon and uh, okay and then that afternoon the uh, my platoon leader came down and he said you're not going said your assistant is going to go and you and I'll sit on the radio and I have something to keep us warm too and so uh, it was I think then maybe the next day or two days later I just finished checking on all the men and so on and I was walking up the, uh, and we we were at Heartbreak Ridge then. That wasn't when the main uh, offensive was going on there. That uh, that was a, another hell of a thing, and I wasn't there. So, but anyhow, um, we were in that area, and uh, here come the uh, company command. Our first sergeant, and he said, uh, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "I'm just checking on my men." He said, "You're supposed to be on your way home." I said, what? Yeah, he said, your name was on the list a couple of days ago. I said, nobody told me. He said, well, get packed up and get the hell out of here. And it didn't take me long. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think your proudest moment from over in Korea was? Like I told you, I'm not a hero. I, I just, uh, being able to be with the guys and, mm -hmm. and like I say, uh, some of them, uh, I, I still am in contact with them today. Mm -hmm. In fact, last week, I called, uh, he's from New York, uh, 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 John Benny, uh, he had a, a second platoon, a good friend of mine, and I knew he had dealt some health problems, and I talked to his wife, and uh, so on Tuesday I called, and I I said, her name is Frances, and I said, this is Frances Bell. And uh, she said, oh, I'm so glad you called. Uh, it was so good to hear from you and so on. But we had to bury uh, John today. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, and I think just about any uh, guy that's been in combat or service, period, uh, you have a come Rodri, that it's hard to beat anyways. Yeah, yeah. So how old are you today, Frank? 88. 88. So tell me a little bit about um, when you're when you're getting ready and you're packing up and you're getting out of there, what did that feel like? <laughs> Almost like, uh, like I said, getting sprung from prison. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, what time of year was it when you got sprung? Uh, it was in August. Okay, so it's hot there. Yep. And uh, uh, what do you remember about the the land? So the landscape kind of mountainous, but kind of more dry mountain. Or what do you, what do you remember about the terrain there? It's it's mountainous, although not like I say like, like the Rockies. Uh, we called it Old Papasan and Children of Kumwa area, and that was ten sixty two, and that was. One of the big ones, and that's uh, that would be in meters. Mm -hmm. Did you? Uh, I, I'm guessing that when you're out in the field, you're pretty much with other Americans. Did you have any interaction with the Koreans? Uh, we had uh, 
chogies that we hauled ammunition for us and okay. so on, and food. Okay. Uh, we had, uh, we always were uh, right alongside the Turks. Hmm. The Turkish Brigade was uh, kind of like a sister unit to 35th. Hmm. What was that like? What it was? Oh, they're like? crazy guys. <laughs> what do you mean they're crazy? Oh man, uh, they. You know, we wouldn't think of having a fire at night on a line, you know, to, because right. that draws fire like crazy. Mm -hmm. But those guys would be up all night drinking, and uh, I think, and uh, mm -hmm. fires and having a big party. Hmm. Wow. And I don't know, one of them told us that, uh, I said, how come most of you guys got big mustaches? You have to kill so many guys, I don't know if they shoot to that or right. not, but no, they're tough. Yeah. They're great soldiers. Yeah, yeah. Was it nice to have them alongside? You bet. <laughs> Even if they did uh, yeah. make fires that night. So, uh, how long did it take? Uh, tell me about leaving Korea. How long did that take to to leave, and how did that go? <laughs> Too long. <laughs> uh, we sent to Sasebo, Japan, and we spent a week there. Okay. And then we got on a, some kind of a ship that I could have swam. <laughs> or swum faster, um, whatever the vernacular. Uh, it took us uh, 17 and a half days to go from Sasebo to uh, San Francisco. Okay, wow. And then they put us on a troop train at Camp Stoneman, and that took six days to go from Camp Stoneman to uh, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, where I was discharged. Wow, that's a long time to get. <laughs> And it was kind of interesting. I, uh, buddy and I, we hitchhiked from there to uh, Valley City, and so I walked in the yard, and my mother was down in the garden as mm -hmm. usual, and uh, she said, "Oh, you're home, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> and then it kind of got to her. She grabbed me and hugged you. Oh, that is. What do you remember about being home? How was that walking back to Valley City? Great. Valley City. I bet it felt you'd been a world away, right? Yeah. Yeah. What did you? Uh, what was that first time? But what, what, what happened? How did you get back into regular life? It, it, I didn't take long. Yeah. You know, uh, the college was starting, and I had to get busy with that. So I did. You go to North Dakota State. Went to Valley, Valley City, City. Uh, and then uh, got my master's from North Dakota State. Okay. Now you went into teaching. Yep. Right, teaching and coaching. Yeah. Tell me about that. Why did you decide after to do that? Long story. I don't think we have a lot of time. Okay. Carol, uh, I just uh, I was going to uh, North Dakota State, and uh, I needed some money, and took a job over in a Class B school, uh, just coaching. Mm -hmm. And we won the state championship, 27 straight, no losses. And I thought I was another John Wooden or something. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was really, I, I coached seven years, and I was really blessed with a lot of great kids. I mean, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, one thing led to another. My great wife uh, mm -hmm. came sure. along with, with me, and... Uh, uh, to the thick and thin and the good and bad and uh, 65 years later we're still congratulations yep and, and Joyce is here in the studio with us so uh, let me ask uh, what 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 ways do you do you still think about your time in the service how, how often does that play with in your very mind? often okay what are is it good is it bad most of it's good okay I still think about the guy that didn't come back you know yeah that must be hard, right? It's very hard. Is it? Uh, is there guilt about that? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, I, I don't have any guilt about it. I, I know that you sometimes wonder why uh -huh. this one and not me, but uh, that's the only. And I, I'm not. I don't feel guilty about it. Sure. Sure. I know that one of the last uh, uh, casualties we had, a kid from Texas. Uh, uh, he was in my platoon, and I just stopped in to visit him. It was around lunchtime or noon, and 
a mortar round came in and landed right between us, killed him, and uh, never touched me. Hmm. It's just the just one of those. Yeah. You know, it's fate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know that that you know that something like that. And uh, you know, I I can see why some guys have nightmares. Uh, mm -hmm. I had some that it, it's really kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say dumb, but the nightmares I had were experiences that I had never gone through. Hmm. Something my mind made up, so, you know. Yeah. Did you, uh, do you think that being in Korea or being in the service helped you? In Absolutely. Your life? In what way? One thing, it, it made me a hell of a lot better man than I uh, was, I'll tell you that. Yeah, what, 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 in what way do you think it made you better? Learning to obey people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Learning to take the responsibility for yourself, mm -hmm. for other people. Yeah. Do you, uh, uh, when you look back, why do you think Korea is the forgotten war? Well, you know, they, they called it a, a peace action or, you know, the, the, try to, so that the thing didn't spread any further. I, and uh, consequently, uh, the, uh, I, I don't think the press took it up like, you know, uh, Iwo Jima or Okinawa, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a lot of fanfare in that because I was old enough to know what was going on during World War II. Mm -hmm. Did did you um, when you came back were people did people understand Korea was there or were they kind of because when you think of the fifties and even that you think of moving on and the Eisenhower years and and the baby boom hitting did people remember or even kind of know what was going on? I th I think uh, many of them did. Okay. But some of them could care less. Sure. Sure. Uh, how did the, uh, your older, the, just the slightly older generation, the generation of your brothers, how did the World War II vets or even the World War I vets, uh, did they welcome the Korean yes. soldiers back? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. What was, uh, when, you, when you look back at it today and see that there's still conflict in Korea, what do you think as a guy who's been there? Uh, I, I have some uh, misgivings about the situation. Uh, okay. We took a devastated country and made it, you know, wealthy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've done that so many different places and we seem to forget about good old USA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, thanks we get in many cases isn't too good. Yeah. There was, uh, I don't recall anything bad about coming home like some of the Vietnam vets. Yeah. I, uh, the 35th Infantry uh, uh, Association that I belong to is made up of, uh, I would say, 95% uh, Vietnam vets. Mm -hmm. And all great guys. We, Joyce and I go, we've been to Philadelphia and all over. Uh -huh. It's, it's a, a great camaraderie thing. And uh, those guys are great, uh, the Vietnam vets, and um, the uh, most of them, uh, you know, are, I want to say acclimated now, or don't think about that, but they have, uh, you know, uh, really to me that they, they had some bad times when they got home, people mm -hmm. not, you know, uh, I don't know whether you call it patriotic or not, but they were they were very unpatriotic to treat soldiers that way. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. What was the first, when you came home? What was your welcome? Was there any welcome home? Any fanfare? Or you just you got off a no. ship? Tell me about uh, that. Well, like I said about the one, we got off the ship. Uh, one of the things that was really great uh, is see the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, never seen that before, and sailing underneath it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we got off the ship and they put us on some kind of like a ferry boat that took us up to Stolman. The first thing they did is marched us over to a mess hall 
and gave us a big T-bone steak and all the milk we wanted to drink. You know, and it was just <laughs> that because you'd miss the milk. Of it. Yeah, I'm guessing it was all powder, number right? One, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the uh, uh, like I say, they, you know, you're going home, and it, it's a yeah. good feeling. Did you uh, did you lose weight? I, I talked to a lot of soldiers when they came back, and they always said most of them said we I lost a lot of weight. I came back a better man, but a thinner man. Fifty pounds. Huh. Fifty pounds. Uh, I played quite a bit of football in college, and uh, I uh, I was around two thirty right in there, mm -hmm. maybe a little better than that. And even through basic training, I I had lost some weight, but not much. But it didn't take me long in Korea to go down to one hundred and eighty-five. But I could chase down slow greyhounds and old trucks, you know, at that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's amazing. Did what, what's the first thing when you got home and got free after you that six day train ride back to Fort McCoy? What did you do? What did you want to like? What was the first things that you remember wanting to do or did? Oh, you know, you look around to see if you, any of your old buddies are around. Yeah, I have a good friend uh, uh, that lives up at Scoby, and he was in the same outfit in Korea, but earlier, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he, uh, I'm trying to think, he was in the reserve and so he was one of the first ones called in the uh, latter, or latter part of the summer of 1950 mm -hmm. and uh, got shipped over to the, and he went to the 35th and wasn't there very long and got pretty well shot up, mm -hmm. spent about a year in Walter Reed and so on, uh, hospitals. And uh, but he, he lives up in Scotty and uh, uh, I talked to him from time to time and, and his feeling is about the same as far as I know. Were you injured at all? Did you ever have to spend time? No. You were lucky? No, I lucked out. I, what, they say that the, the power of smell is the most powerful of all human sen uh, senses. Do you remember any of the smells over there? Was there anything that, that you always associate over there? Yes. Okay, what is it? Cordite. Cordite, tell me about that. When a 76 or a artillery shell mm -hmm. or those things come in or a hand grenade, mm -hmm. the explosive in there is cordite in many cases. And it's got a ugly, stinking smell that you'll never forget. Hmm. And uh, I know that uh, uh, I had uh, excuse. I was going to say I had five guys that they shouldn't have been bunkered up together like that, but I think it was about noon hour or something, and they were just getting together to shoot the bull or whatever. And uh, around got all of them, and I was there just a few minutes later, and the, the smell of that cordite has never left me. Yeah, it's amazing how I think it, it is the strongest of all sen or of senses is that smell. Yes. We remember smells. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, when you look back, Frank, what's the what's the thing? One of the reasons we do this, and one of the reasons I want to do this, is to preserve the memories and your experiences. Because I think it's important for people, not just today, but in the future, to look back and if they want to know what Korea was like from people who were in Billings but also knew that, what do you want them to remember about the Korean War? What do you hope that they take from this? Well, I, I always said we didn't lose it, and we sure as hell could have won it if uh, the politicians would have let us. Mm -hmm. Yet I didn't think that. Um, General MacArthur had the right idea to go into China. I, I think that would have been a disaster. Yeah. But uh, 
And that's basically what I think. You know, like I say, we didn't lose that war. Uh, we were able to stop, uh, you know, thousands of Chinese coming down and so on. And uh, uh, kind of put them in their places, yeah. more or less, and uh, so on. So, have you ever been back to South Korea? No. Do you have any desire? No. Okay. When you see film of North Korea and what's going on there, people starving and stuff, is that hard to see? Or how? Do, when you see Korea, because South Korea is doing is oh, a prosperous country, fabulous. and North Korea is is desolate. Is that hard knowing that you you've got this personal connection? You spent part of your life in yeah. that area. What's that like when you see those reports? Well, uh, it, it, it's worrisome, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because uh, I sometimes question the mentality of uh, Kim and his gang. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, even uh, uh, a very tame dog. You get it cornered, he's going to act up, and that's them. Uh, you know, same thing with uh, Iraq or Iran. Um, you, you can't trust them, and I don't trust China from here to your microphone. <laughs> What's the um, so you had how many kids? You've got how many kids? And how seven. Many, seven. How many grandkids? Sixteen. <laughs> Any great grandkids? Eleven. Eleven. Wow. What do you hope they remember about your service? What, do, what have you told them, or what do you hope well, they Well, uh, the grandkids, uh, not not very much. Uh, some of them, because they have had some uh, military relationship, but most of them, you know. They, how did that affect, did, did you, did it affect how your, how you parented, or did it affect your relationship? Did your kids go into the military, or did all my boys? Okay, two, two in the Marines, uh, one a lifer, uh, uh, retired uh, major, uh, and uh, I have the, my youngest son is a, a lieutenant colonel. He's still in. He's in the Air Force, and then uh, son lives here in Billings. He was a nuclear subman for six years. That must make you awfully proud. Very much so. Like I say, we come from a long line of military people. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I sometimes look back at it and think, uh, maybe I should have taken a commission when they offered me one. Did they offer you yeah. one when you came back? Yeah. No, before I left there. Okay. They, Colonel Jones said, I think you'd make a good officer. And I said, well, what does that entail? And he said, we'd like to have you stay another three months in Korea. And that nixed the whole deal. <laughs> you were ready. You felt like you had. Yeah, uh, yeah. Did, when you're over there, did you count time? Can, can, or do, Is that something that happens? Or do you, you, know, you don't count time until you've been there probably about seven months. Okay. And then you started. And then taking. you start counting. And then talk to the other guys, you're short timers, you know, we got long whiskers, so. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, um, and you didn't count, start counting until you were over there, was that superstitious, or you just didn't do it, or how did that I, I, Well, you know that you're going to be there a long time, so, so just you don't your... bother counting. <laughs> were there good memories from Korea? Oh, there's a, uh, you have a favorite memory? Funny thing is, like the night we shot a pig, we thought there was all kinds of activity out in front of the okay. MLR and uh, all hell breaks loose and in the morning there was a great big hog of some kind or other that, that was in the wire and he was tenderized. I, I bet so. <laughs> and the, you know, the, the, there's lots of very, very funny or humorous incidents. Uh, I, uh, had a little guy from Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, I don't know why I can remember that, but uh, it was one of the first days I was online, and all of a sudden there was two explosions and some hollering, and then two more, and the 
platoon leader came down. He said, what the heck is going on here? And it, this kid said, well, somebody threw two at me and I threw two back. Hand grenades. <laughs> there was nothing there. But anyhow, it, we all got a good laugh out of it. And uh, uh, I, I, some of it, it you know, it, at the time it wasn't so humorous, but I think back, I, I uh, very, very dark, uh, kind of weather like this, rainy and, and uh, no moon or stars. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I turn on, on uh, uh, to be alert and uh, I hear this and it sounds like somebody's crawling in the gravel and I'm just tense as a fiddle string. And finally, uh, I'm, I'm about ready to start throwing something myself. And uh, the moon came out kind of, and there in front of me was a rat about a foot tall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> eyeball to eyeball, it was just, uh, <laughs> took a swing at him and uh, that was it, you know, I didn't hit him, didn't hit him, but uh, anyhow, it, it, like I say, there's a lot of humorous times and uh, guys doing something. Another good friend of mine, he passed away here a couple of years ago from, uh, uh, he lived in Phoenix, Joe Noga. We got called out at like one thirty in the morning and it was cold and it blazes. It, uh, they said it was 24 below that morning and uh, we, went, we were in blocking position and we went up and it, they took us on trucks and we went over uh, somewhere uh, west of the punch bowl over in the Mundane Meat Valley anyhow and uh, dumped us off and then we marched uh, probably close to a mile and then we stood there and didn't do anything, just stood there. And this friend of mine, Joe, says, God, he said, Dolly, he said, I've got to <laughs> do number two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, well, go ahead. And, uh, well, he said, well, you know, all the guys standing around there. And I said, just go over there in the snowbank. And he went over there. And so I had a... Uh, we had a camera, kind of a, a platoon camera. It, it was a Roy Rogers camera, so you can imagine how good it was. Right. And, but I took a picture of him with his jaw dropped, you know, and he never forgave me for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are a lot of good memories. Too. Yeah, yeah, a lot of good guys. Yeah. That, uh, uh, when the, the first. Um, reunion we went to was in Scottsdale. And I got a phone call from uh, Robert and he said, are you the Sergeant Dahl that took care of us in Korea? And I said, who is this? And he told me who it was. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm the Sergeant Dahl that you guys took care of. <laughs> you took care of me. And he said, well, we're having a reunion in uh, the 35th uh, in Scottsdale. Now I'm going. Why don't you come down? So so we went. Mm. So like I say, we've been to San Antonio, Denver, Philadelphia, Reno, Portland. You've seen the whole country. Oh, yeah, we uh, Springfield, Missouri. It's been great. It, we just like I say, like old old home week. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so few uh, Korean vets anymore. It's yeah, that's uh, bothersome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, when you uh, uh, when you talk about uh, when you tell people about time in Korea, what do you tell people? What do you most of the time tell people about your time in Korea? If you're just a tell, or what do they ask about your time in Korea? Uh, my uh, my boys, be they were in the service. They ask about stuff from time to time, and never uh, prying. Right. And uh, I probably have told you uh, as much as I've told anybody about. Well, I appreciate that. 
that's a good point for me to say. I just want to uh, uh, say thank you so much for coming and sitting down and being part of this. Uh, thank you for your service. I, I appreciate what you did, and I appreciate uh, the sacrifices that you made, too, because uh, I don't think people understand. You've taken years of your life for service, and uh, that means something. Well, thank you, and like I say, I, I told you at the beginning, I am not a hero, and uh, I hope I have been candid, but you have. not. Uh, you know what? I I, uh, I think anybody who uh, who gives part of their life for service to others is a hero. So you can say you're not a hero. I get to pass that judgment. Thank you so uh, much for sitting down with me, Frank.